Assalamu alaikum, khair. Good evening, my name is Ibrahim Sveh, I'm a neurosurgeon and we are transmitting live to our international audience from the Farah Medical Campus here in Amman, Jordan. The topic for tonight is interesting and I think anybody who, who will miss this presentation will not really good about it. It's a gunshot head injuries and we concentrate on the penetrating brain injuries. <coughs> The injuries can happen due to car accidents, which is the commonest cause of uh, death in the Middle East. And Jordan is country number third, I think, the third country in the Middle East for the incidence of uh, traffic accidents, only preceded by United Arab Emirates and Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Per capita? Per capita, yes. Uh, we are peculiar with this type of accident, which is camel accident. Wow. This is very common in Saudi Arabia. And and the camera kind of stray across the streets and they get into the cars. Usually it's fatal accident. Sport injuries, domestic injuries, children falling, industrial injuries, penetrating injuries, whether quarrels or fights or drug cartels or whatever. These are real cases. Uh, this was a psychiatric patient putting nails in his head. And this little child was running with this tool in her hand, penetrating into the brain. And this boy with chopsticks in his mouth. So these are penetrating injuries. But our topic for tonight is penetrating injuries, second to missile, bullets, and so on. <coughs> so traumatic brain injury due to missile wounds are the most lethal injuries. I've seen penetrating injuries, but the most lethal is the one caused by missile injuries. 52 to 95, they die at the scene. This paper from Hammond, analysis of this big number of patients penetrating ones of the brain from the days of Vietnam. These are uh, illiterate kinds of penetrating injuries. But here we are talking about civilian penetrating head injuries. In the United States, firearms, brain injury, is really an epidemic problem. And everybody knows the fight between the many companies and the government uh, and that lots of uh, weapons are in the hands of the public. Uh, this paper also speaks about civilian gunshot wounds to the head. So it's a common problem looking into the literature. Again, civilian gunshot wounds uh, this is from Iraq. Let me show you some videos so that will get you into the mood of what we are talking about. If you find this to be graphic, I'm sorry, but the idea that these things are real and we should face them. The first uh, video is about a man who's being arrested. He's a con man. Yeah. He was, he's now stationed in the police station. The officer is speaking to him. Uh, I don't know. Yes, exactly. It seems that he had previous convictions. That's why he feels that he's stuck. So he asks for a bottle of water, the officer gives that to him. The officer leaves the room and he finds it a chance to do something nasty. So this is a penetrating inside. This is a congressman. He made the press conference to so tell people that he's innocent of the accusations, but suddenly he produced this gun. Uh, 
the famous Messiah injuries when uh, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, 23rd of November. Can you see the film? <coughs> and this is called Zabradar film because it was uh, registered by a man called Zabradar who was carrying his camera. He was the only man in the scene carrying the camera. And these are the only shots people have seen of the accident. This is the first bullet hitting him in the throat. And then the second bullet now will come, blowing his head away. Now Jacqueline will jump into the back of the car to get parts of the brain of the person. She keeps holding this part of the brain until he's buried in Washington. Now we'll come to the local scene. What happens in our countries? With the side. In this part of the world, we shoot in the air. A martial kind of thing. We want to show that we are powerful males. Shooting in the air, they think it is uh, safe. These bullets will travel in the air and come down on the heads of uh, victims. But in this particular incident, the man carrying the gun will make a mistake. And he will shoot people who are coming to celebrate a wedding. This is in the Middle East, and Jordan is part of this. I don't think these weapons are allowed in Jordan. Sorry? I don't think these weapons are allowed no, in Jordan. No, they are allowed. They are mistaken. No, but that's a machine gun. Oh, yes, they are. Oh, yes, they are. Whoa! Oh. So, waiting now is... This first one going to shine. This is a wedding. No. <laughs> the man is shooting in the air. His son is sitting inside him. The woman is happy occasion. Also speaking about us in this part of the world, leaving, leaving pistols and guns in the house in the hands of people. This little boy showed his father shooting there, so he just imitated him. So this is the reality of penetrating missile head injuries in, in the Middle East. My interest in head injury was very far back. This is the first paper published, 1980, about the patterns of head injuries in Jordan. I was still first division president. And when I went to England, I published this paper, 84, about a traumatic carotid cavernous fistula, this Iraqi girl with carotid cavernous fistula due to penetrating injury due to car accident. And I published this paper also, I think that was 86, about epilepsy uh, incidents, comparing epilepsy after surgery for aneurysm or epilepsy after an injury. And 10 to 30 percent of people would develop epilepsy. That's if they survived. Also, I published this paper, 88, Conservative Management of a Connex of Dural Hematoma. And we published many things, among them, penetrating the injuries in Jordan, myself and my husband, Hamad Assad, this was published recently. And also, uh, Rami, who's sitting here, you are here, Rami. Yes. And then was a new surgeon from Palestine, him and I and others uh, wanted to show that this lady, Jajit Tahis, was the first female neurosurgeon surgeon uh, in Palestine. <coughs> so this is Jajit Tahis. <coughs> Is she still practicing? Yes. She is. She's doing a great job there in Palestine. And uh, also, Ram and I published this paper just last year about the title reads Traumatic Brain Injuries Caused by Missile Once in the North of Palestine, a single institution experience with 520 consecutive civilian patients. This paper is one of a few large series addressing this issue. And 
and uh, I will ask Dr. Naomi Tarouzi to refer to this at the end of the lecture. So these are the missiles. And putting the one dollar note to say that it's very cheap to buy these things. So they could be low velocity, i.e. bestial. They could be high velocity, exploding the head completely. And these are some of the high velocity in the so-called Arab Spring. It could be accompanied with a lot of other injuries, like a Zobacus injury here, tracheal injury here, spinal injury. So it could be multiple injuries due to these penetrating injuries. And they are classified mild, moderate, severe according to the extent of brain damage. And this gives us the Glasgow Coma Scale. If it is severe, it's 3 and below. 8 to 3 is moderate. 8 to 15 is mild. <coughs> the worst outcome of these are in the bihemispheric and posterior fossa. So if there is a bullet transverse in one side to the other, this is worst. Or if it is in the posterior fossa because of the brain stem. What is the mortality in the bihemispheric? Very high. Almost 100% of the surface because of brain stem involvement. Look what, the, what it does. Complete depressed, comminuted fractures. It can cause hematoma. It can break the skull base, so skull base fractures. This is usually fatal. The man who you have seen, the congressman shooting himself and you see the blood coming through his nose because he damaged his carotids and vertebrates. You can damage also the air sinuses and you get air, free air in the intracranial cavity, aerosol, like this, and when it comes like this, it's called Fuji-san, after the Mount Fuji in Japan. So when we see this, we say this is severe pressure and it needs to be evacuated. It can happen in the head and in the, in the Neck, for example, can cause extradural hematoma, can cause subdural hematoma, it can cause ventricular hemorrhage, and it can cause cerebral blood injury. So this is an heavy fistula caused by missile injury. In this paper, it is rare to have cerebral injuries due to missile, but in this paper, it's an old one. Only two traumatic aneurysms were found among more than 2,000 patients. A blood vessel injury in this paper, I think this came from uh, France, and you can see pseudo aneurysm there due to missile injury. Here again we have facial artery injury. Here we have posterior syndrome pseudo aneurysm treated by coiling. Again here, vertebral, this is V3, uh, and uh, this is pseudo aneurysm. Same here, complete cut of the vertebral artery on this side. So, you can see that's dangerous, and also it can cause a brain edema, and with a brain edema, cortisone or steroids are useless, so please stop using steroids in head injuries. People are still using it for no reason. And with all this, brain hematoma, subdural hematoma, brain edema, the process of brain herniation starts. So if the region is here on the left side, the brain starts to come from the left to the right, underneath the force, and this is called subfalcine herniation. If the pressure continues, then the tumoral loop would like to come down through the tentorial hiatus, it's called tentorial herniation, and here you can also send the tonsil down and this is called Fermin Magna herniation. This is called trans hiatal herniation. Supratentorin, infratentorin. And this is usually fatal. What happens here? This is the <coughs> temporal lobe herniating. Comes to the midbrain. This is third nerve, third nerve. So the first thing, when you see the patient, you'll find that his pupils are okay because the third nerve is okay. But then, the temporal lobe comes down. It touches the third nerve, it stimulates the third nerve, the third nerve is parasympathetic, so the pupil on the same side will get constricted. Pressure continues, 
pressure on the nerve, paralyzed the nerve, parasympathetic is paralyzed, only sympathetic is acting, so the pupil will get dilated. Pressure continues, then we push the other third nerve against the edge of the tentorium, and this is simulated, so it becomes small. And if you push hard, it's bit paralyzed and you get bilateral flexibility. So these are the changes. And I always say, do not look for the size of the pupil. It's not important. What is important is that these people are unequal. So whenever you have an injury in the, in the emergency department, please forget about ophthalmoscope. There's no time for papillary to occur. Just look for the size of the pupil. If they are unequal, this is top emergency. This is the top emergency in the whole of medicine. And the neurosurgeons look like a crazy running around because this is the time you can save the patient. Once you reach here, it's too late. Brain death. So if you do angiogram, blood is not going to pass inside. If they survive from this, then they have post-traumatic sequelae. Epilepsy, brain abscess, meningitis, ventriculitis, cognitive functions, emotional changes, hydrocephalus, one dealing problems, CSFE, DBT, etc. Retained bone fragments, what should we do with this problem? 4 to 8 percent incidence of infection with bone fragments. So it's high incidence of infection, uh, not very high. Uh, and the bone fragments are more dangerous than the metallic fragments. The reason being that the bullet when it comes there is heat and so it is a bit of more steroid than the bone the fragments. Seizures, epilepsy, as I mentioned in our study, we found up to 30% uh, chance of seizures. CSF leak and then there is high infection rate in these systems. And this is one patient of mine, also came from Palestine with bullet injury and he developed these abscesses and ventriculitis uh, of which he died. Hydrocephalus because of all this either someone has hemorrhage or infection, ventriculitis, whatever they develop hydrocephalus. So the best management is uh, aggressive management, early aggressive management, we believe in this but not all people but believe in this. Here uh, in, uh, paper from England, penetrating injuries, uh, aggressive surgical measurements. So they go for aggressive treatment. Others, protocol of delayed surgery. So it depends on the case and on the center. Again, this paper from Colombia, I believe, about these kind of cerebral injuries, what to do. So they put this uh, program, our uh, protocol, if the glasocoma scale is a three, in first direct pupils, there's no surgery. Still people in this part of the world, they still do surgery for people with first dilated pupil, telling the family lies that, well, we're not losing anything, let's do surgery. A lie. It denotes that you are bad in your surgeon who does not understand the pathophysiology of head injuries. So you operate only on these when you do the CT scan with a hematoma. So there is a certain protocol. And sometimes, if there is severe edema, then you would do something like this. This is called uh, craniotomy uh, decompression, the craniotomy so that the brain can uh, expand out. The bone which you remove, you put in the tummy, in the abdominal wall of the patient. And this was actually the experience of the American Army yeah, a long time ago. So this is a common in the war zone because you don't want to separate the patient from his bone flap, so you put it in his abdominal wall. How long usually keep that? Usually you wait for six months. Because you put it in the abdominal wall to preserve it. Just to preserve it with the patient in a sterile condition and so on. It in, work, in, in, in the Middle East and in Jordan, and I tell you real stories, bone flap was put in the fridge and the cat took the bone flap. <laughs> Or the whoever was cleaning the thing, oh, what is this? <laughs> they throw it away. <laughs> so you end with a big bone flap, patient is not there. Again, this is from Boston University about how to deal with these, with these cases, whether you do surgical exploration or not. And when you mention head injuries and 
Anybody who was in the neurosurgery knows that we use bone wax, bleeding from the bone, we put in something called bone wax. And the man who discovered this is Sir Victor Horsley. So we say, give me Horsley bone wax. Horsley was in the Middle East, he was in Alexandria, and he died in Iraq. And this is his grave at Amara. Let's see some of the illustrative cases. This girl, 10 year old, with this little catch one in her ear. She was doing well. MRI, CT, look at this. So sometimes things are not what they look like. This little thing can hide something big. So there is this fragment. We did angiogram. There is no vascular injury. Lucky, she's lucky. There's no sinus injury, nothing. Sinus is still painted. And she complained of nothing. No sense of leak. So we did not interfere. This doctor from Kurdistan, he had a gunshot injury and he came to us with uh, meningitis and brain abscess and we found this bullet in the middle fossa, as you can see there. So we went in, removed it, evacuated the pass and he managed well. And this little boy, six year old male, came from Libya, uh, he was at home and his brother just picked a pistol with his father, he was playing with it, and then he, he shot his brother. And he came to us, drowsy and right-sided weakness. He was sleepy. <laughs> Barely you could arouse him. And there was inlet in the left frontal area. He had hemiplegia on the right side. These are his x-rays, showing these metallic things, fragments. So this is the entry. The bullet stayed inside, so it went this way, and it stayed here in the parasurgical region. Of course, you can see that CT scan is, is good for these trauma cases. There is subdural hematoma here, interhemispheric. So this is the inlet, fragments of bone and mittens. And the trauma <coughs> the track and the bullet is staying there. Where? In the motor cortex. So that's why he is hemiplegic. So we did angiogram. This is external angiogram, external carotid angiogram. And then we did the right carotid angiogram, the left carotid angiogram. Seems to be okay. We did the vertebral angiogram. Seems to be okay. And we operated upon him using the navigation uh, machine. Do you have anybody with the navigation? I say hands are from Ziyad Saleh uh, Foundation. They provide us with this machine. It's, of course, here it's very important because you are, you are digging in the brain, so you have to know exactly where you are so that you can pick up the bullet, evacuate the hematoma, remove the fragments, and so on. So we operated on both sides. We operated on this side, and we operated on this side. Let's see the... Uh, Position of the patient, that's not how you see the patient. We will be operating on here, this side, and then we'll move to this side. This is the right side, this is the left side. Okay? Is there a difference in the prognosis? The bullet came in and out, there was an inlet or an outlet, or don't and we, we will address this uh, when we discuss yeah. the last things that we have done. It was not outlet, this one stayed in. Sorry? Yeah. This one stayed in. Yeah. Yes. So here, we are retracting, this is the midline here. We are retracting the uh, motor cortex this way, away from the, uh, from the dura. And this is the bodies. Now, is it important to remove? No, but it is in the way, so I remove it. My aim was to evacuate the hematoma and to stop any bleeding. But if the bullet, look, look at these spots, if the, <coughs> sorry, it's not corona, I'm just coughing. Uh, if, if the bullet is in the way, I remove it. If not, I don't, I don't care. Uh, I don't go for surgery just to remove the pieces of the metal there. But here, uh, there's hematoma, there's edema of the area, and it happens that the bullet was on the way. 
Now, after that, we will proceed. Now we proceed to the right side where the inlet is, where the brain is. This is the brain. It's coming out on its own. But then there is hematoma, and bone fragments, and metal fragments. So, so you this want to remove the bone fragments? Right? Yeah. Bone fragments, which are accessible, are removed. Bone fragments, which are not accessible, you don't. You will not uh, run after these small pieces here and there. But here there is edema, there is bleeding, uh, fragments, so we do this. Uh, the brain that you removed, you're going to implant it in the abdominal wall? No. Yeah. We will just put the it's skull it's in the abdominal wall. <laughs> Uh, so this is the hematoma here, the, and you will see that we remove some bone fragments now, on the way. <coughs> Normal brain tissue is difficult to suck. Traumatic brain tissue is easy to suck. So our aim is to control the bleeding, do uh, whatever we can to give the patient the best chance for. So this is a piece of the bone that we have in the bone. Sorry? Yes. We will, we, will, we will do uh, perineoplasty six months later uh, using either uh, something called the uh, a uh, bone uh, dust, uh, bone uh, acrylic that we make into a powder that you put water in it to make a bone, or we use artificial uh, pieces of mesh. I think that's a certain type of bone. You can. Sometimes what we do, and I did that many times, I come to a normal area of the skull, split the skull into two halves, take the half and use it there. But this is another surgery. Another risk case on the patient. So, as I said, the aim here is to evacuate. Look at this piece of bone. I'll come back to that. Piece of bone embedded. Sometimes you'll find hair, sometimes you have dust, gravel, feces, everything you find in there. Was this infected? Or? Uh, potentially infected, of course. Any, any head injury like this is potentially infected. So that's the parasagittal area on the left, and this is the frontal area on the right. <coughs> this patient came awake because we have decreased his intracranial pressure by removing the hematoma and giving him medications. Still, he's having hemiparesis. Started to improve slightly. This is the CT scan afterwards. We have done surgery here, we have done surgery here. <coughs> and this is a regaining his power completely. We were lucky. Now I'll come back and ask Dr. Rami that was it to join me here. Uh, as I said, Rami, myself and others <coughs> uh, did this paper. This is original article published in the World in Neurosurgery. 2018. And it was best to talk about it, but Rami. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Professor Speer, uh, for this opportunity. It's my honor to stand in front of all of you and be part of Professor Speer's weekly presentations. Um, my name is Rami Darwaz. I'm a neurosurgeon and in the following slides, I would like to talk about our paper that we published in uh, 2018. It included Professor Speer and I, my father, who's a neurosurgeon as well, and three experts in TBI back from China. Uh, the title of the paper, as uh, you see, Traumatic Brain Injury Caused by Missile Wounds. Uh, pay attention, we use the word missile. Missile, the definition of missile is basically any flying objects. We did not only have injuries because of the bullets, we had some injuries from shrapnels, from bomb explosions, and so on. So the proper term for that was missile wounds. 
all of our patients came from north of Palestine, and as you see, it's a single institute experience. We were able to collect 520 patients. The real number, actually, thousands, much higher than that. But due to missing data for the rest of the patients, we only could obtain this number. Finally, uh, I would like to talk about the, our patients were all civilians. Now, the literature for regarding this uh, topic divided into military personnel or civilian. What's the difference? Usually when you're talking about military personnel, they receive injuries from uh, very powerful uh, guns, the military guns. It's a bit different than the normal guns, uh, as we saw earlier in some videos. However, most of the civilian patients in my study, they received uh, injuries from uh, 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 military guns, which are really powerful guns with high velocity. Uh, now we had uh, 99 patients sustained additional injury, which were extracranial into abdomen, heart, and uh, so on. Sorry. Um, as the physical materials, as you can see, we had the three types. The first one is the metallic bullet, which were more common in both children and adults. The second one was the rubber bullets. I'll show you later what is rubber bullet. And the third one, were the shrapnels from bomb explosions. Now these are an examples of the metallic bullets. These are the rubber bu bullets. As you can see, it's a piece of metal surrounded by uh, rubber. Now it's a little bit tricky term. A lot of people think, and a lot of military personnel will tell you these will cause less injury compared to the metallic bullets, which is wrong. These can kill as much as the metallic bullets. They can cause devastating injuries. And lastly, these are an example of shrapnels that comes from bomb explosions. Now here an example of a rubber bullet. Basically inside of it is a piece of metal and around it uh, it's covered with a, yes, rubber. And as you can see, it can cause devastating injuries. Some of them can penetrate uh, the, the cranium, the brain, and so on. <coughs> Now, for the types of uh, injury, what we call it the mood of injury, there are five types. Some of you ask about the prognosis of this type. Uh, the first one is we call the perforating injury, and this is the worst one. This type of injury has an entry and exit uh, wound. So basically, it enters from one side. Uh, the power of the bullet and the speed is so high, so it has the power even to penetrate from the other side. The second one is penetrating. It has only an entry side. The third one, this is a bit rare, it's called ricocheting. It enters, but the power of the bullet is not so, it is not so powerful to penetrate the other side. So basically it bounces back. However, this bounce causes multiple injury. It can bounce one time, two times, several times. So basically it has several injuries. So basically these two are the worst. The fourth type is careening. It does not penetrate the brain, however, penetrate the scalp and the cranium, and it stays inside, so it kind of extra axial. Uh, however, this bullet has a shock wave basically surrounding it, so it is also dangerous and can injure the brain. And the last, the last one is tangential. Basically, it causes a cut wound. Uh, it does not stay. The difference between these two, this stays, this does not. It can cause a small scratch or a cut wound. <coughs> However, as you can see from uh, this image, the shock wave around the bullet can cause hematomas and injury to the surrounding brain. And there are published papers uh, with, uh, with patients who received these injuries and after time they deteriorated and died because of active bleeding. So basically these two had the worst outcome, then come this one, and these two had the favorable one. Uh, in our study, we only had three types, tangential, penetrating, and perforating. And as for the mortality, we had 20 patients who had perforating injury. Unfortunately, all of them died. So as you see, this is consistent with the literature. Perforating has the worst outcome. Then the penetrating, we had almost 40% uh, death. And tangential, all of the patients survived. So this is basically the summary for perforating, 100%, uh, almost 40%, 50%.
for penetrating and zero for tangential. Uh, additionally, our results were consistent with the literature and high mortality uh, were observed in bi-hemispheric as Professor Speer clearly elucidated. It comes from one side and exit from the other side. And uh, in addition to the posterior fossa because of the brainstem injury. Most of the time, this patient does not survive. Uh, as for the site of injury, uh, in our patient, the frontal lobe were mostly affected, then followed by temporal, parietal, and occipital with posterior fossa. But the frontal lobe had most of the terms. Um, as for CT scan, uh, many people consider it as a gold standard. Uh, we do not prefer to do MRI for these patients due to artifacts and uh, more importantly you don't know the, um, what type of metal that foreign body made of because of, as you know MRI is a strong magnet and it can cause migration of that uh, foreign body which can cause further injury. Um, this is an interesting case of a patient who had a rubber bullet. Uh, this is the entry and this is the exit, uh, the lodging uh, place. So uh, we, after time, the bullet indeed start migrating, so we perform the second craniectomy, so to remove the metallic part. And in our experience, and we mentioned that in our paper, we recommend repeated CT scan at six hours or sooner if there is neurological examin uh, changes or deterioration. <coughs> and as I already mentioned, um, MRI, although it's superior to CT scan, it has little use in uh, evaluation of uh, these types of patients. Now as for uh, DSA, these types of patients uh, susceptible to something we call traumatic aneurysm. And uh, in our study, we performed DSA on six patients. These patients suffered from clinical uh, symptoms of subarachnoid hemorrhage, like severe headache, uh, stiff, uh, stiff neck, photophobia, and so on. However, we did not detect any traumatic aneurysm in all our patients, in all these six patients. In case, if you detect, you need a, a quick intervention, whether with scrolling or clipping. Now, as ventricular injury, uh, we had uh, 30 patients who had ventricular injury. The conclusion, when ventricle involved, the prognosis is always bad. Among these 30 patients, uh, 23 died, two had vegetative state, and five had severe disability. All of the vegetative and severe disability, we call it unfavorable outcome. So in conclusion, if ventricle involved, it is a bad prognosis. Now for clinical management, uh, most of the literature, as in our case also, support the aggressive surgical management, uh, which include the compressive craniectomy in patients with clinical manifestations of persistent increasing ICP. Now there was one study that was done by a group of uh, neurosurgeons from South Africa. They intentionally delayed the surgical intervention for patients with gunshot wounds, and the uh, outcome was uh, the mortality increased up to 80%, so they had to abort the study. So basically that study uh, is an evidence that aggressive surgical management for these types of patients is the right choice. But even uh, Of course. We had even one patient with Glasgow coma 15 over 15 who started deteriorating and they delayed, only performed conservative uh, management and the patient died. So from 15 to death. Now for dura closure, we use the pericranium and temporalis fascia, the temporalis muscle fascia in most of the cases, and in some cases, we use also the fascia lata that comes from the, from the thigh. <coughs> As for medication, uh, we use third generation cephalosporin, um, cloxacidine. Also, there was a group of uh, British neurosurgeons published a patient uh, published a study uh, about the effectiveness of third genera generation antibiotics for these type of patients, and they recommended the uh, seven to 14 days 
two years. Yeah. In addition, we use diuretics, anticonvulsants, and analgesic. Analgesic <coughs> for anticonvulsants, we use the phenytoin for two years, and if there was no uh, there was no evidence of a seizure or epilepsy, yeah, we stopped it. Uh, as I earlier mentioned, DSA was, was used to detect the traumatic aneurysm in six patients, and we did not de detect any aneurysm. In, although it is rare, but it is very important, and uh, we believe every patient with the uh, traumatic uh, TBI due to gunshot wounds should undergo DSA. Now, this table basically summarizes our study. Uh, in this column, you can see the Glasgow Coma, coma scale, and this one is the Glasgow outcome scale. What I want you to, <coughs> what I want you to focus on is basically the higher the Glasgow coma scale, the better the outcome. We did not have any mortality. Now, the lower the Glasgow coma scale, the worse the outcome. Now, uh, in our study, uh, we had only 50 patient, female uh, patients. Most of our patients were uh, male in both children and uh, adults. Some papers explained it uh, because females practice less risky behaviors. Because of that, they have less chances to encounter these types of injuries. And uh, the major fatalities and mortalities in our uh, study were uh, in young adults in 20s and 30s. As for the complication, the most complication, indeed, there are many complications we had. The most common was the motor deficits. And with time, it improves. But still, some patients will experience it for the rest of their lives. Um, some of you uh, ask what we should do with the intracranial bone or metal fragments. Now, for deep retained bone or metal fragments, uh, we had 190 patients. If it's really deep, we do not interfere. With time, some of those uh, fragments will migrate and reach the cortex. When it reaches the cortex, yeah, we perform uh, surgery. And uh, for seizure, in our practice, as I mentioned, we uh, give anticonvulsants, uh, phenytoin, for two years, and we stopped it if there were uh, no seizure reported afterward. Now, CSF Lee, CSF Lee and CSF Fistula is another complication in these type of injuries. And we had 27 uh, patients who developed CSF Fistula. All of them were treated with lumbar drain and uh, recovered. And for hydrocephalus, 16 patients developed hydrocephalus. All underwent VP shunt. Uh, finally, for rehabilitation, most of these patients will uh, suffer psychological uh, deficits and uh, they cannot sleep, they cannot interact, they cannot socialize. So in all, uh, our, in, uh, among 520 patients, uh, 211 patients required rehabilitation, including uh, psychological help. Thank you. Thank you. We'll leave uh, room for the questions and then I just want you to imagine that you are under the Israeli occupation in the West Bank and you're having such injuries where well, cities are cut off, hospitals are cut off. What would you do? I think it's so brave and so courageous for these people under the occupation to do so and to present such a study uh, from under occupation. This is great effort. Uh, yeah. Raise my hand for you, Rami, for this Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, if you go back to 1967, 242 resolution asked for immediate withdrawal of the Israeli occupation from the occupied territories. And the occupied or the occupied is just the same. This is the longest occupation in history of anywhere in the world, and it must end for people to live peacefully in a, a good and just peace. We are all for a just peace, but not for people taking the lands of people, occupying them, and harassing them. At the end, <laughs> at the end leaving uh, guns in the house, 
leaving kids to play with it, and shooting in the celebrations and the weddings, which is a habit in the Middle East, in Ben Jordan in particular, and it's taken as a Mashu sign, a male sign that we shoot in the air. Uh, this sh also should be stopped. And I will end with this to show you the horrible effect of the bullets. So stop the bullet. With this we finish. <laughs> Any questions or comments, please? Uh, number one. Well, uh, you were saying that sometimes the, this, uh, this is a metal of bone that's left that you can leave it there and it eventually mm -hmm. migrates back up to the point where you can do yes. something. During that migration back, does it cause any further damage? Yes, it can. That's Actually, in those deep uh, placed uh, fragments or metal fragments of bone fragments, uh, you don't want to go after them, so you wait. And the only reason for indication that if they migrate. And what they do sometimes, they actually migrate to the foramen magma. Or they migrate into the ventricle, foramen magma, causing hydrocephalus. Or migrate into a vessel, causing damage. So you go after them. So the migration may cause further. Absolutely. But very rarely they do. Very rarely they do. So, uh, go for it, Adam. Thank you. Uh, first step. I would like to, again to kind of congratulate Dr. Darwaze for his great effort. It's really something to be proud of, and we are very proud of it. Uh, uh, just curious, what's, uh, if there is an explanation, why the ventricular involvement dr drastically worsened the outcome? Well, I'll, I'll ask that. Uh, the centrifugal force of injury uh, that was demonstrated in mostly in the motorcycle accidents when you actually rotate. So that would damage the cortex go into the center. So when you reach the center, you have damaged most of the brain around you. So whether it's a centrifugal force or direct injury, center of the brain is most dangerous. That's why the results are like that. Please. Dr. Mamon, please, Mamon, please. 
although we see it more frequently in shear injury, have you seen have you seen uh, evidence of diffuse axonal injury? Yes. Uh, a friend of mine from Russia, he is very uh, well known in the world for his work on this, showing these uh, changes on MRI, where you find diffuse axonal injury. So the patient on admission, MRI, the patient on discharge, you will find all those axonal uh, damage. So shielding effects or no shielding effect, you can demonstrate the axonal damage on MRI. I think it will be hard to... Let's see this with my daughter, please. <laughs> <laughs> I think it will be hard to assess because you can't really do MRI for a patient Absolutely. with bullet yes. injury. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Some handles, please. Uh, I'm going to tell you about it. 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 Is there any evidence support that uh, bifrontal involvement of uh, the iterating head injury, the outcome is better than if it is involving temporal lobe? Uh, actually, yes. And I have experienced this myself. Uh, yeah. I was finally a resident of Justar in, in England, and it was my last night, last weekend, on call, and I received this boy uh, that was Saturday evening. And Saturday evening they had the football match all over England. So he was attending football match with his parents, and as they were coming back by the train, he put his head out, and the coming train hit his head. So he had my frontal injury. Uh, when I received him, his brain was coming out. Actually, I received a phone call from the referring hospital, and the child there was saying, I have this boy, a brain coming out. I don't think I should refer him to you. I said, what's his blood pressure pass? He said, there is pass blood pressure, so I said, refer him. When he came, it was a bad injury in the front of him. At the end of the day, he survived, and we celebrated his birthday in the hospital. You operated him by, yes, by, by yeah. front and decompression? Absolutely, yes. No, I operated him by the debridement, right. stopping the bleeding, bleeding and uh, repairing the dura, repairing the, the dura by taking facial atta from here and there. At that time, we did not have the screws and things, so I had to cut part of the brain of the skull in two halves and then cover the bone. So yes, Thank my frontal is better, better than the temple. Please, yeah. again. Uh, I'll, I'll just add the uh, comment that these injuries, um, that in general, especially uh, with my very small experience with the vascular intracranial traumatic injuries, they are uh, very bad injuries, even in the most uh, developed areas of the world and the most advanced centers of the world. Have you seen it in the United yes. States? Yes, I've seen. The last one we dealt with was a very unusual uh, patient, young patient, where they've been actually um, using uh, uh, a nail gun. I'm sure yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nail gun. Yeah, yeah. So it's a nail gun injury, and for whatever reasons, that nail gun fell out of his hand, and uh, uh, a 20 centimeter nail. <coughs> went through his head and you could never nail the basilar artery that way yes. and interestingly the patient arrived alive to the hospital um, the bottom line with all the expertise involved literally in the most advanced centers in the world he died I just want also to uh, make a point about children carrying objects and running away from you this happens in the house they pick up a pen, a pencil, a knife, or something, and when they run, they run like this, looking that you are following them, and when they fall, it always ends in the face. So don't run after them. Try to calm them and take the object out. And never, ever try to take these penetrating things at home or in the emergency. It has to be done in the hospital, and the GA, when everybody is ready. Uh, that patient died once the nail was removed. Yeah, Absolutely. It was a That's why we effect, get the old yeah. bleeding. Uh, any more questions? If not, I just want to speak to my Israeli neurosurgeons colleagues. I have plenty of these people that are friends of mine, and we have been sharing our friendship for so many, many years. I ask them in the name of God that they should work, and I know many of them do, work for peace, for a just peace. The whole world, United Nations resolutions, 242 and the others, 60 resolutions asking for this Israeli occupation to finish. Once it finishes, peace will domain 
the peace would be in our area. So I ask them to be with us in the peace for everybody, and I hope they will understand. Thank you very much.